to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Today, my guest is Erica Corday, a diversity and inclusion coach who has dedicated her life to expanding how others interact with the world through powerful conversations. As an entrepreneur and certified coach, Erica's work is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, imperfect allyship, and imposter syndrome. Her work has taken her into communities and onto national stages as a speaker and educator at noteworthy industry events like Alt Summit, She Podcasts Live, and Being Boss. Erica is also the owner of an inclusive beauty salon, Silver Immersion, and the host of Pause on the Play, a podcast that features open dialogue on topics like company culture, visibility, and mindset. I love this podcast, by the way. (laughs) I just have to tell you. She lives in Maryland with her two children. Erica is wise, she's down to earth, and she's offering practical tips and conversation starters for those of us seeking to expand our knowledge and understanding of our fellow humans and who want to incorporate DEI practices into our personal and professional lives. I really enjoyed meeting Erica, and I'm expecting that you are going to enjoy it too. Hi, Erica. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hello, Luann. How are you? I'm great, and I'm smiling ear to ear because I have looked forward to this conversation for a long time, and I'm really thankful that you've come on the show with me today. I'm so excited to just kind of, you know, just sit at your knee here a little, Erica, and get some wisdom. So (laughs) (laughs) I'm extremely excited to be here. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. So I'm I'm taking your lead. I'm here. Okay. Well, what I want to do is I want to start with reading what you say in the introduction to your podcast, Pause on the Play. And I want to share with you that, of course, as a podcaster, I listen to lots of podcasts. And as a rule, I will, you know, forward, fast forward the button on somebody's introduction because it's their introduction. We all know. But yours, I listen to every time because it makes me think and it reminds me of the importance of what your whole th- platform and your messages. And it's it just it's a good place to c- keep getting yourself back to. So I'm going to read it. It says where you are challenged to examine your beliefs question your predisposed notions and consider realities you may have been unfamiliar with in order to understand that they too are real. And that is just a heck of a lot of truth in that sentence there, Erica. And I just thought, yay for writing it, yay for being it, yay for bringing what comes after that sentence in every podcast that you have to us. Um, but maybe start by talking about that, about this this podcast that you have and your mission in this on this planet to do this work. It It is, first of all, I have to acknowledge, it is amazing to really just kind of sit back and to hear it that way because mm. I, I say it. And of course, as a podcaster, intros are not always like, I'm just going to say this one time and I'm good. So sometimes <laughs> I have said it, I don't know how many times in a given setting. And to hear that on the flip side of how it really is just kind of a recentering and mm. it's a tool for 
you know, where are you and what are you thinking? What are you doing? How are you feeling? And that really is, is humbling to me. And, um, we've been playing around with the intros and outros and the only shift that I've really made with the intro was to shift it to being challenged to reconsider your normal. Mm. And that's because we all have a normal. We all have our baseline that we come back to. It's that need to understand that there are simultaneously a ridiculously high number of normals that are operating at the same time as yours. And are you considering theirs or are you only centered in your own? And so it's, it, I really hadn't thought about it as, as a tool in that way, but <laughs> hearing that reflected back from you is, is great. And it does really link back to what we do because the entire point is to get be people to think about what have I not considered? Uh, what have I not been exposed to? Mm -hmm. uh, what varies from what I've been conditioned to believe, whether it's through society, uh, the people I'm around, my family of origin, and being able to go beyond that and to understand that dialogue really is a starting position for a lot of the change. Because if we're not talking with each other, if we're not normalizing, uh, what conversation is between people that may not have otherwise been in conversation, then where are we going? What are we doing? And how is it that we can assume that the changes that we want to bring into reality are going to stick? You know, when I hear a lot of people that are like, oh, we need to change laws. And I agree. And you can change a law. And if people don't want to adhere to it, they won't. Mm. We've seen what that looks like. And so I think it's very much top down, bottom up, and it's that meeting in the middle. So a lot of the work that I do on my own, as well as what comes uh, through all of the conversations we have on Pause on the Play is part of this, how can we work on the bottom up piece of the puzzle? Well, and I love it because first of all, you, you heard exactly what I was my sentiment was it is that refocusing me each time I hear it. So um, I, I don't know that I would have expressed it that way. But when you said it now here, I'm having my aha, aha listening to you. I'm like, that's what it does for me. It's like I go, OK, check back in. Right. What are you right. doing? How are you showing up? What are the conversations you're having? How are you participating? Right. And then to take into a couple of other things that you said is it is true. Every person has a like I, when I think about sometimes just my brother and I, we are 18 months apart in age. I literally just said this to my mother last weekend because I had my high school reunion recently and she was asking me about all my friends. And of course, she knew many of them, of course. Right. And she said, oh, something. She said something, whatever. And I said, no, I don't really. I know. She goes, well, I think Donnie, you know, whatever, whatever the conversation was. And I was like, well, I wouldn't know. We had such a completely different high school and she's like mm -hmm. what do you mean I said mom when Don and I talk now and we talk about when we were he was 13 and I was 14 and a half and he was 15 and I was 16 it's like were we in the same house <laughs> like like <laughs> it's so crazy that whether we're talking about re relationships with our parents with the same friends that we had with the teachers and when I think about that how different our normal is our reality is our our perspective is and we're from the same two parents and 18 months apart of course right. every individual human person on this planet then you add to it all of the diversity and all the different places we come to right I mean it's how can it be anything other than that it's that's true but it is still it's still humbling to me how many people don't consider it right and they do um, tune into the podcast and take it in, whether it's through the actual, you know, listening to the recording or our show notes, which we've, you know, from an accessibility standpoint, tried to make sure that even if you can't listen, that you can still read it and still kind of get that same mm. aha mm. that when people are taking in the content, they're like, I didn't think about right. this. Like even same household, same parents, same bloodline, same area, same gender, none of those things really hit home to color in the truth and the fact that you can be in this, you could be twins mm -hmm. and have a completely different experience. And so the lack of understanding for the variations of experiences of those that don't live 
love or look the way that you do. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, apparently I have a lot of work to do mm-hmm. and I'm here for it. That's so. right. That's right. And I love that line. You say it on the show a lot that don't live love and work the way you know look the way I do that is also it is every time you say it it it's another right between the eyes moment for me that you know we really do have to be open and 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 as you say it's the dialogue because it is the dialogue even like I said I mean we need to have this openness across, like you're, you say in your website, to us, diversity is more than race. It's variety in gender, um, sexual orientation, um, lived experiences, ability, professional calling, and so much more, right? So we have to have the openness to understand when we're talking with somebody that their reality that they're describing is real. And I, like I said, I've, when I talk with conversations with my brother, I've literally long, long, long ago, you know, we're in our late fifties now, stop saying that's not true. It's like, it's true for him. (laughs) You know what I mean? Right. That's the piece. I'm so glad you said that because it's, it's too often that people will say, no, that's not accurate or no, that's not true or no, it didn't happen. And again, if we can have simultaneous realities happening at once, who's to say how you processed it, mm-hmm. how it landed with you, mm-hmm. how you felt about it, how you internalized it and then, you know, reacted from that point. And so it is so important to acknowledge that there really is what actually happened, which unless you have a tape transcript of every (laughs) moment of your life, you don't have that because we all process things the way we do, which is why the game of telephone exists. We are all processing it the way that we do. And so we have to hold space to understand that we are processing through our own lens and it doesn't make anyone else's lens wrong. It doesn't make yours right, but there has to be a space of understanding that, we all have something that came through our lens. And what do we do with it then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the lenses are, you know, I'm just getting the visual when you go to the eye doctor and he keeps, he she or she keeps flipping all the lenses. How about now? How about now? How about now? Right. Because it's, you have the lens of maybe it is your sexual orientation or it is your race, you know, whatever your professional calling, as you said, but then, you know, you add those other lenses of just what was the environment in your childhood? You know, are you an A plus driven person or are you a more laid back person? There's dozens of layers of lenses that inform the way we react um act act out you know not just react but act both sides of that you know to every stimuli every conversation every action every event around us right absolutely and that's where there's there's so many small kind of activators that are there at any given moment and it's understanding how do these things intersect? And so again, like if you were to have lost a parent during COVID versus losing a parent three years ago, mm. none of it would have felt good, but it would have absolutely felt different to have possibly been like, I can't have a funeral. I can't go. I can't be in the room. I, I'm grieving alone. Mm-hmm. So we have to think about what's intersecting with any of these individual feelings, actions, thoughts, experiences and what has gotten us here and being able to kind of navigate them and to not do it in a way that, well, that's wrong or that's not what I know to be true or that's not what I believe and understanding that you don't have to know what you don't have to understand it. It's still reality for someone. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that is the crux of the beginning or the possibility of an open communication. If you intend to engage in an open communication, I think you have to start with the commitment to whatever might come in this conversation. I might not have ever heard before. I might not have ever understood before. I might not have ever thought was true before, but it's not for me to deign that true or not true or right or wrong. I'm, you know, have to come and listen and process and have conversation, right, Erica? Too often, people don't even understand what real conversation is. So I, <laughs> I have to acknowledge that first. Like, they don't understand that, first of all, it is about 
the fact that there is a minimum of two people that are contributing here, sometimes more, but there's at least two in this conversation. And everyone is coming with some type of frame of reference or perception that they're going to filter things through. And everyone here wants to be able to feel as though their reality is being witnessed and considered in the outcomes. And they want to know that they can communicate as their whole selves. Mm -hmm. And when that is unable to happen, this communication is skewed from the word go. And so if I'm not able to be myself, I'm not able to communicate honestly and truthfully and transparently and vulnerably. So people need to know that that can happen, that they will actually be witnessed as they share their emotions, they share their truth, they, you know, talk about or type about however it's being shared, um, what it is that for them is coming up and what's in their body that they need to get out in this moment with you. And if you are in this communication, simply waiting for them to stop talking so you can jump in like a terrible game of double dutch, mm. this doesn't work. Right. This does not work because you have not actually understood anything I said because you simply wanted me to stop talking so you could talk. You weren't listening to me. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And you know what? It's funny because I'm a, a big student of sales, Erica. I've studied sales, sales since I'm 10 years old. And that is one of the most critical mistakes a salesperson can make is to not be paying attention to word for word and just be getting and setting up what you're going to say next. And uh, there's no question it's a greater sin when you do it, when you're having an interpersonal conversation that you've at least expressed outwardly was for the benefit of both of you to have a deeper understanding of each other. And then when you don't come with that frame of mind of I'm listening to what you're saying and I'll worry about what I'm going to say once you're done. Right. Right. And, you know, the 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 coach in me is just like you can't support people in that way and you don't have to be a coach to value active listening mm -hmm. and i mean I, I i'm sure you've heard me say it on the podcast stfu is free and abundant and people don't take it enough they're so busy like <laughs> i need to talk it's like shut the beep because <laughs> stop talking if we talk less I can hear my kids in the back of my mind, like, like quoting Hamilton as they do talk less. <laughs> and so, you know, people are so busy wanting to be witnessed, wanting to be heard because people don't feel as though they are being heard, mm -hmm. but yet they don't understand how they've just put that burden on somebody else. Right, right. You know, it's funny. I love those two lines that you said that people are, the reality is they're wanting to be witnessed. And you said that they want to come and be able to communicate with the, their whole self. They want to know that they have that trust that whatever I say to you, you will at least just sit back and consider as opposed to just knee jerking and telling me either I'm wrong or it's not right, or here's a better way, or here's a real, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, right. And, and that being witnessed, it's funny. I don't know where I came across it years ago, I, I often think it's either Dr. Phil or it was Tony Robbins or it was Oprah. It was somebody. <laughs> it was somebody in my life years ago. But said that as humans, we seek out that pairing up, okay, because as humans, we want our life to be witnessed by somebody. And, right. you know, and I remember when I heard that. I remember looking and thinking about my husband at the time, and I was probably young. I was in my probably 20s or whatever it was. And I remember thinking, oh, just always see what he does and say, I saw it. You took the garbage out. Thanks for taking the garbage out. Or you just helped one of our kids. That's so cool. You're a great dad. Like, I just like, that's what it is. We're, we do the things because we're, if we're a good person, we're, we're, we have our own inner compass, but it's nice, and we just want somebody to say, I see you doing amazing things. You're fabulous. You just hugged our kid, and our kid felt better. Like, whatever the, the big or small gesture, right? Well, and it's just like when people um, talk about, like, you know, the love languages mm. in that, you know, 
is is it that they want a, a gift from you? Is it about the buying of things, mm -hmm. or is it that you paid attention to them enough to know what it was that they would like for you to buy? Mm -hmm. And that's where, for me, whether it is you know the again using the love languages as a uh, baseline here, you know the words of affirmation, acts of service. Uh, physical touch, any of those things, it's also seeing what's behind it. Mm. And that's where I feel like people don't peel the onion back enough to go there. Because for, for some people, if we think about the imperfect allyship that I talk about a lot, it's not so much that I think everyone wants to feel as if I'm a good ally. Please tell me that you saw what I did. <laughs> right. It's that I think we all can, you know, take a certain amount of, of solace in being able to, to witness the evolution that we're a part of. We're recognizing the differences of mm. things and that's important. And for us, we had a post that went out on social media recently and it was part of an episode that we'd done with E.K. Powell about um, African-American vernacular. Oh, I listened and, to that one. Yeah, that was right. a good one. <laughs> and he acknowledged, you know, give us credit. And Indy and I have been talking about, you know, what does that mean? How can that show up? And we've noticed since that has gone out that there's been people that are like, yes, and this was the concept that I used and this, I learned this here, or I, you know, this was mentioned to me by this person. Thank you for reiterating this to me. Mm -hmm. And that has been like, oh, thank you. And, mm -hmm. and it feels good. Mm -hmm. And it's not about us. It's about the outcomes that are possible mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. And it's about the understanding of what really comes from that? Because now it's acknowledging that I didn't come up with this on my own. I got it from somewhere else. You prompted me to do something differently. And here's an outcome that I wanted to share with others. Mm -hmm. And I feel it only feels right for them to know that this didn't come about just of my own accord. Mm -hmm. I want to just say thank you to you. And there's so much power in that type of, you know, conduit continuing of people feeling as though I've contributed, it's helping to make a difference, and I can see how this is helping people to do things differently, to do them better, and now we can rinse and repeat. So good. It's so good. And, and you know, it's funny because like almost every, I mean, every episode I listen to you, I get an aha. And um, in that episode, talking about it was when, when he used the um, comparison of the Spanish dialects mm -hmm. and you know it's the same language but up in he said in in the Galician area they speak it this way and this way and how you know you can trace that it comes from you know the demographic of where it was born and all the things and when you apply that to the same thing as the as say, say the initials again I'm so bad at things like that a A-A-V-E. A-A-V-E, yes. I always want to say A-E-V-E, and I'm like, it's not that, Luann. It's A-A, you know, -A, right? <laughs> um, but it, you know, it was logical. It, was, it made logical sense as if when, you know, we understand very clearly people in Portugal speak Portuguese and people in Brazil speak Portuguese, but the dialect is a little different. And that's a logical thought. And the way that you guys discussed the, the AAEV and the way it developed, it was like, well, that makes perfect sense. And why do we say don't speak this way or judge when the language is spoken in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where we have to, again, understand that just because it didn't happen the way that you think it should mm -hmm, have. Mm -hmm. That didn't change the message. That didn't <laughs> change, you know, what came out of, of their mouth. Now, you might feel differently about what came out of their mouth, but what they said or what they typed or what they communicated was not different. What you're doing is you're imparting your will. You must conform and do it this way or I won't acknowledge it. Right. And that shows up in too many ways of if you don't do this in exactly this way, it doesn't count. Right. And it's not okay to discount people's experiences and efforts in that way. Right. It was so eye-opening. It, it really, really was a, a fabulous conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, okay, so tell me something. There's something on your website that says, um, 
you are not expected to know it all or to have access to everything. You just have to be willing to stay in action. So Mm -hmm. you work with a lot of individuals and, you know, solo companies and larger companies. Um, I imagine individuals as well to help them with their desire to be a better ally. Your whole thing is supporting imperfect allies to take imperfect action. And of course, I keep quoting from your website because I just love the way you put everything out there. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that, Erica. What happens? What are, where are some of the places when, in your experience, whether you're working one-on-one or you're working with a small company or whatever it might be, what are some of the desires that that your clients come to you with? And what are some of the starting points that you say, okay, we're going to get working together, but you know, here's what you have to look at first, or here's what, what's what can you walk us through that a little bit? Absolutely. So for some people, it's, I want to work on hiring practices for some. um, It is, we want to work on company culture. You know, we bring somebody in, how is it that we operate? Um, how is it that, uh, you know, how do we do reviews? How do we handle um, any challenges? Uh, how is it that we talk about ourselves from a languaging standpoint? So, you know, how do we market ourselves? Who are we actually trying to attract? Who do we want to work with more of? Who do we enjoy working with? How do we want to work with them? Um and it it goes into that kind of from the business perspective, but it really starts with, you know, why does your brand exist? What do you want to create? Why do you want to create it? Who is it for? Who are you supporting? And whether it's an individual, whether it's a small business, whether it's a larger corporation, none of these things work well if you don't first understand your values and why it is that you want to take these particular sets of actions. And so that's why, you know, everything that I do with anyone in Erica Corday or through Pause on the Play, we have now shifted to where you must do our masterclass from implicit to explicit first, which helps you to identify your values. Because without that, we can't help you. I can't help you because I don't know why you're doing this. You don't have a filter to be able to audit. Why am I taking this action? Why am I not taking this action? You know, this is what we're doing six months later. Is this aligned? Uh, is there a purpose for this? You know, why do I want to speak at this event? If you don't know the intentionality behind it, you're just taking action for the sake of taking action. And that's not what I advocate for. Mm. So everything it's going to start with figuring out your values. And then from there, it's just being really clear about what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? Who do you want to do it for? And let's be honest with ourselves about how much you want to change and that it's going to take time. Because I think the biggest thing that I run up against is people that want to change everything overnight Mm. and it's not possible. (laughs) Number one, that's jarring to anyone that's taking in your content. It's jarring to you as well, because you cannot integrate that quickly, Mm. but you know, you didn't get here overnight. Mm. And so it is incremental change. So we have to know what we want to change while we want to change it, what has to happen. And we just have to start and give ourselves grace as we move through, because it's not a perfect process. It's not always a linear process. You can feel like, great, I went ahead. And it's like, oh, wait, nope. I just went back a step. Okay. Mm. And, you know, you you have to be patient with the process and you have to be patient with yourself. So what is it? Is it that, for example, would a particular company might have a goal of saying, hey, as a as a human person, I have a pretty diverse circle of uh, network of people, family and extended family. But when I look at my company and I look at the clients that we're attracting, am I attracting a diverse clientele? So is like, I'm seeing as thinking about a lot of the businesses that I can picture right now. Right. And thinking, Mm -hmm. Hmm, you know what? Somebody, many could probably look in the mirror and say, huh, yeah, we tend to attract a lot of people who look, think, and talk like us as opposed to a diverse group, okay? I understand if your own personal circle is more diverse, then it's probably more likely to carry to other areas of your life. Don't I don't think that that's lost on me. However, 
um, depending on the size of your company, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm, when, am I hearing properly that a company might come to you and say, I want our company to attract diversity in its clientele. Is that a legitimate thing? And then what you do is you say, fine, that's awesome, but we have to get to why. Because if your why isn't clear, we're never, you're never going to be up for the hard work that it takes to do it. That is correct. And I want to acknowledge that before you can even figure out what the why is, um, there has to be this place of acknowledging was this a response or a reaction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because after everything that happened, um, unfortunately, after the murder of George Floyd last year, mm -hmm. a lot of people were simply reacting. Right. They were not responding. And so it was, I don't want to be canceled. I don't want to look like I'm not doing the right thing. Right. I don't want to look like I'm not diverse. And so you have to first acknowledge, like, what, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear in that I have had people that, they may have started there, but they didn't stay there. People that mm. stay there, I don't continue working with them for very long. Because it's not authentic, Be right? It's just no. for a show or it's just for getting clients mm -hmm. or it's... Right. Right, right. And, and the reality is, is that you want more diverse clients. Do you want more diverse clients because what you have can support or benefit a diverse population or is it because it makes you look better? Mm. Great way to put that, it. That's the difference. That matters. Mm -hmm. That That's matters right. usually. Right. That's the differentiator. I mean, do you, you know, do you, so there are people that come at for uh, so selfish reasons is basically what we're identifying. Oh, this, I, I'll look better if I do this. This should be better. I, you know, the world thinks of this, especially the bigger companies, I think in the, in the beginning mm -hmm. were very um, guilty of that. Do you agree? Like the ones that had the money to throw money at it right away. And it sort of looked like, really? <laughs> right? Well, and unfortunately, that is true. And at the same time, I saw a lot of small companies doing it because they felt like, you know, let's use the kind of chasm that is Instagram. People were so afraid of people popping up on their pages and calling them out. Oh, your mm. page is all white. There's no diversity. Um, you're you're using AAVE. You're appropriating other cultures. Um, and so they felt like, what can I do? to appear better on the surface, but not actually change anything. Because the reality is, is that wanting to create a more diverse client base, you can't do that if it's not safe for you to have more diverse clients. If you have a group coaching program, can you bring people in that are diverse and it's actually safe for them to be themselves, mm. to have open conversations, to be able to have their needs met because they can ask the questions that they need to ask and so, so often people are like, oh, I just want this diversity. And it's like, but can you bring them in? Is it safe for them to be there? Mm -hmm. Do they, are they represented there? Are they tokenized there? We need to talk about what's actually happening before we just kind of, you know, insert black person or insert Asian person or insert Indian person because, hey, here's someone that's brown. I feel really good about myself now. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. You no. talk about that, about it being safe for uh, people to be in uh, in that in, in an environment, right? Tell us a little bit. Is there education that you can give us on examples of how anyone listening might say, whoa, actually, I didn't realize that I was creating an unsafe environment when I bring XYZ person into my coaching program or into my design firm or I interact with them as a client? Because I feel like it's, it's what we were saying before. If you don't ask, sometimes you don't know and you have to be willing to hear the, the answer and then take it and think about it and say, am I guilty of this, right? Right. And the, the biggest thing that I have to say even before I kind of can answer you is to say that there's no one answer here mm -hmm. because okay. there are some people that are going to respond the exact opposite of mm -hmm. an example I give so you. True. And there are going to be some people that may say yes, but they want to know what they're saying yes to mm -hmm. before you just kind of insert them in this and are like, wait, I did not know what I was getting myself into here. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that it's important to be transparent about what your efforts are. If you do not currently have the type of diversity that you want and you're inviting other people in, 
I think it's important to acknowledge, you know, these are the efforts that we're working on. However, if you ever feel as though um, there's anything that we can do differently or that would support you, please know that, um, you know, we take this evolution seriously and we want you to feel as though you can share um, your, your takeaways and your experiences with us. There's going to be some people that are going to say, I don't want to be involved in this. Figure it out first. I don't want to be the guinea pig. Some people are going to say, yes, I am willing to come into a space in order to begin to work on diversity being able to exist here. And I'm willing to be a part of laying the groundwork. I am, I'm that type of person in, in a lot of instances, because if it doesn't happen, it will never change. Mm. And it's not okay to put someone in that isn't willing to do that. Mm. Um, you'll have times to where someone may be one of the only, and it's like, it's not okay to say, Hey, so what do you think we should do here? Mm -hmm. And you've now kind of put the onus on them to correct what's wrong when it's like, no, you need to do your own research. Mm -hmm. You need to hire somebody and figure out what needs to be done. And you can ask me for context, but please don't assume that I am here to give you a way to get out of doing the work that you need to do to evolve this space. I'm not here to answer these questions for you because after last year, especially a lot of people of color, especially black people were assumed, Oh, you're black. So you can answer my DEI questions. Mm -hmm. No, that's not how that works. Mm -hmm. That's, that's just like, it's not okay to walk up to someone with a uterus and assume you can tell me how periods work, right? (laughs) No, no. That's not how any of that works. <laughs> See, I love you, man. I do. I <laughs> just the things that you come out with, you're like, oh yeah, that's totally clear. <laughs> so there's this point where it's like when you assume mm-hmm. that yes, you can answer this, that's not okay to assume that somebody wants to be a part of something that you didn't give them the opportunity to opt out of. You mm-hmm. just assumed, oh, you're on board and you're gonna help me with this, right? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, Mm -mm. let me choose that. And I think it is very important to pay attention to if you are assuming that other people are supposed to educate you versus you doing your own research, Mm -hmm. uh, paying someone, reading your own books, taking workshops and seminars, um, or are you assuming that someone else is going to answer it and you just kind of get to bypass that? Mm -hmm. Um, Are are you looking for them to educate you or are you looking for them to give you context? Mm -hmm. Because it's also important to remember that none of us that are of color or from a um, underserved community, we're not a monolith. So you can't assume that one person now gives you all of the context that you need for an entire group of people. And it's not okay to assume that one person's experience is going to be the experience of everyone. There are some people that are going to say, I'm black and I've never felt racism. Then you're going to have someone that is white that's going to be like, I clearly understand what racism is. I understand that reverse racism is not a thing. And I don't want to be a part of utilizing white supremacist culture to tear down someone else if and to benefit it from benefit from it myself. I don't want to I don't want to do this. Mm. So I think anybody can be anywhere on the spectrum and it's important to find out where they are. I don't assume that every white person is racist. I don't assume that every person of color has been marginalized or treated poorly. I don't know what you've experienced and I have to treat you as an individual and to be able to allow you to have the space to uncover what your reality is because it's an ongoing thing. We live every day. And so our perspective changes and what we know to be true evolve with what we what we learn mm-hmm. and what we what we go through mm-hmm. so good so good and and it's the thing is what you said in there is i want to make sure i understand it so i get it we don't expect someone else that especially that we invite in to do something in our world and then expect them to be the person who teaches the rest of us you know right from wrong or whatever it is right but i you said a line in there we take the this evolution in this company in this organization in my brain whatever seriously so do i understand that say there is an interior design firm listening that is an all white firm and is has an opportunity to hire a, a superstar young or old whatever um black designer to join their firm 
And so mm-hmm. I hear you. That that new hire is not there to teach their company how to behave and what to do and all the things. But it is appropriate to say we take this seriously here and when you want to pull me aside or you want to make like what is what is that about so that that like you said that person feels safe like how how does somebody that is trying to diversify their own business say that line to somebody so that it's respectful and that the intent is coming from a place of growth and um, connection as opposed to onus and putting the responsibility on somebody else. I think that part of it is, is that if you're hiring someone and this person is, you know, they happen to look completely different from anyone else that you've previously Mm -hmm. hired. Like it's basically you know, you're, you're having this conversation to acknowledge these are the efforts that we're taking. This is what's happening. And we do take that feedback seriously. The reality is, is that conversation that you have when you are letting this person know this so that they know what they're walking into of, you know, we do not currently have the level of diversity that we hope to have. However, we are, you know, we're taking actions in order to shift that we're on this path and we want you to know that if there is anything in in particular that we are unaware of that does come up for you please know that you can share this that is something that you can share with them let's say for an example during a culture fit interview which is what i advocate for as a part of the hiring process Mm -hmm. so that a person knows what they're signing up for and whether or not it's a good fit for both parties Mm. but The big piece here is that while I think it's important to have that conversation so that this person has that transparency from you, I think that this is a conversation that needs to be had with everybody on your team. Mm. Because I don't think that anybody should be taken out of the conversation to be able to acknowledge if something isn't going well Mm. or to be able to acknowledge, hey, I think that we have an opportunity here to do things differently I just want to share with you what I've witnessed. Mm. I think everybody that is a part of an organization has a responsibility to be a part of that. And that can't happen if they don't know that you're open to it. So as much as I think that it's important to let people know that aren't really represented in the, in that um, organization currently know what's going on. I think that this should be something that is a part of your company culture. You're letting everyone know this is where we're going. These are the efforts that we're you know, putting in place. This is what we're doing differently. This is how we hope to move forward because people need to be able to choose whether or not that's a good fit for them or not. Because some people may say, hey, I don't really want to be a part of this. And so they need to have the opportunity to choose to be there or not. But if you're not transparent and you assume that they know and that they're on board, then you end up getting the messy middle. So yes. for example, I remember having a workshop with um, an organization last year and someone was like, I ended up with a client that the uh, service that they provided is something that I don't support. Mm. And I had to service them, but I wasn't, in, you know, no one asked me how I felt, mm. you know? And so I think it is important, you know, let's use the example if you're in, you know, a, a a marketing business and you bring on someone and you're like, Hey, we're going to market for this, this cannabis business. Someone might be like, yeah, there's a lot of people in jail for something that they're making money off of. I don't want to work with them. Mm -hmm. They need to have that choice. So that's where the transparency does come in. And that's company culture. You have to decide what you disclose, what you don't, but you also have to understand what happens on either end. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the opportunity to have people that are aligned or not. Mm. But you can do it on purpose or not. You can do it haphazardly and it just happens to you. Right, 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 right. But your message is well said. It's like every, everybody, you know, you, it's, you, what you're basically saying is, do you have a company culture where it's talked about out loud and everybody understands that there's a safe place to talk, whatever it is, whatever their feeling is about your particular evolution of your company and your brand, right? It's like, we can all talk here. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Too, I mean, 
I mean, I was brought up in that whole, like, we don't talk about religion, we don't talk about money, we don't talk about politics. Like, those things just don't ever come to the table. Mm. And for years, we left a lot of ourselves out of how we operated in a professional capacity. And we also didn't know what we were funding with our money mm. in a professional capacity. And now that's no longer acceptable. People want to know... What am I supporting when I vote with my dollars, when mm -hmm. I go spend my money, when I choose not to spend my money? You know, what is it that I am signing on to align myself with when I choose to work with a certain type of organization? And so people just are not willing to not know anymore. That lack of understanding and, and clarity, it it falls flat now. Before, yes. Now, no. Mm. No, no. Exactly. Exactly. No, it's, it's, a, it's, yeah, we, 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 look, we have to evolve. It's, there's, it's, it's non-negotiable, right? I mean, it just right. has to happen now, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me what does this sentence mean? Operating on demographics only without psychographics doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. I think it was um episode 21. We talked about psychographics versus demographics and demographics are the uh, it's the paradigm that we were taught to categorize our clients or customers with how old are they where do they work like if you think about the uh, ideal client avatar and it's this frankenstein person that is like you know i remember in the wedding industry and um my beauty business, you know, she's 26 to 34. She reads red books. She's a nurse. <laughs> and it's just like, who's this person? He reads red book. That's a blast from the past. <laughs> <laughs> and that, But that's it. Like, right. we're literally, like, piecing this human together that really doesn't exist. And for years, I never knew why. It just always felt weird. And I always had resistance to these ideal client, you know, workshops or workbooks or follow this DIY. I'm like, why does this feel weird to me? And it took, you know, many years of realizing that this, this doesn't work. And eventually I just stopped doing it. And at some point, Indy and I started realizing, you know what? It's because it's only based on these societal indicators that don't take into consideration who the human is, which was how we created um, from implicit to explicit, our signature masterclass, which mm. does not rely simply on what are their demographics. It actually relies mainly on what are the psychographics. Not that demographics don't matter. There's always a place for those, especially like, let's say you're running ads. You do need that. That's mm. a part of targeting, and that makes sense. But it is also very challenging to try to figure out who your ideal client is if you limit it based on age, you limit it based on race, gender, socioeconomic status, we find that the people that pull to us are much more based in what's the change they want to make, what matters to them, what gets them fired up, what is it that they want to be in action around. And that transcends age, it transcends gender, it transcends, you know, whether or not they are married, whether or not they even believe in marriage. All of these societal indicators that you could put on someone and the intersections of those, those are not how we are aware of who's attracted to us and who it is that we are actually talking with when we are on the podcast or on social media or in workshops. Demographics simply give you numbers and stats. Psychographics get you to the heart of what matters to a person, why they operate the way that they do, the choices that they make, what fuels them, what ticks them off. Why is it that they make the decisions that they do? And why is it that they don't make certain decisions? Psychographics gives you so much more information and it really gives you a wider group of people that you have not limited to, you know, oh, you can't, you can't be here because mm. you have a penis. I'm sorry. You can't operate <laughs> here. So you're, you're really opening up for anyone that identifies with your message and the overarching goal that you're trying to achieve. You're allowing anyone to be able to, to walk in 
to yes. to to roll into, you know, whatever it is based on um, accessibility. However, it is that you want to be a part of the party. Mm-hmm. Well, it, what, what you know, the image I was getting in my mind when you were describing that is that you know, yes, you have the demographic, age, you know, rank, serial number, all the things that we always look for when we're trying to market to somebody. But then when you started to describe what you know, what motivates you, what matters to you, what excites you, what pisses you off. I, I started to get the visual of name any activity. May, take a, a, a baseball game. Take an art museum gathering. Take a speech by some, you know, poet or something. If you were, go to a comedy club. Like, when you look around, what are the chances that every single person in that room is going to fit those quote unquote demographics that you fit into? But now it's like, it's almost like you automatically come together and probably to your point, much more of the psychographics align. If we're all at, you know, a viewing of the Mona Lisa, we could be from all different backgrounds and demographics, but there's something in there that's talking to us. It, it's, it was just the visual I got for it. It's just an interesting, different way to say, what is the attraction of this group of people together? And to your point, it's what matters to them, what upsets them, what makes them happy, what motivates them, what pisses them off. And that transcends the statistics that the marketing puts to us, right? I love that you said that, and you are 100% accurate. And it's I, I think that that falls flat so often. And like this past Saturday, we went to um, a book signing um by Nikki Giovanni and I took my kids because I'm like you need to go like (laughs) you might not understand who this is now but you need to go and literally age race gender size uh whether or not you are in a sorority or a fraternity whether or not you were a college graduate or not um, all of those things were all so different but the fact of the matter is there was something that this woman has written something she said, something she's done that drew you in, that you wanted to be a part of taking in her message in this way. And I'm sure, you know, what maybe has really struck me with her, which happened to be videos that I watched of her in a conversation with James Baldwin, like that may not have been the thing that maybe stuck with somebody else, with somebody else, it may have been something else. And Mm. I, knew tons I know so many things by her but something about watching those videos of her in conversation with James Baldwin just uh, something about it just hit me differently and that conversation has stuck with me for years Mm. and so everyone that was there was there for a different reason my kids were there because I'm like at seven and and ten you don't quite understand but I want you to be a part of this Mm. and so if they had simply assumed that oh you have to be this age this race, this gender, you have to be college educated. Like so many people would not have been able to be there. And I mean, there were people literally standing out on the sidewalk listening because they wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to really think about, you know, who are you including that wants to be included and are you not allowing people in because you've decided they're not interested? Mm. That's the same thinking and assuming for someone else as opposed to just being open to it and letting yes. them, I always say, you know, let the other person be a grown up. They can decide. Right. right? Absolutely. <laughs> that. Mm-hmm. That. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So one one thing I want to touch on before we go is it's you have on your website speaking up as an ally, wondering if you're doing it right often prevents you from doing anything at all. And, um, you know, we have a a big audience here, Erica, and um, I know that we have a diverse audience. I know that there are um, all types of designers and creatives and photographers and architects and builders that listen to us. And they come from different parts of the world, the country, from different backgrounds. But I think... Each one of us, you like you said, you have to be the imperfect ally. You have to attempt to do it. But that's a very real thing, I believe, is, you know, being afraid to do it, not knowing how to do it, not wanting to look performative in doing it sometimes 
puts, you know, a little freeze on things. Is there something that you would share to help those, any of us listening that just to encourage us to dig in and show up and, and be the ally, imperfect or not? Grace and a pause. Mm. And the grace is because you're going to screw it up. Mm -hmm. I screw it up. I, we have someone in our community that has been a part of um, events that we've done. They'll be on the podcast soon, and they were a part of our Dropping the Veil event. And I misgendered them, and I, I paused. I was like, I, I want to apologize because mm. I misgendered you, and I think it's important you know, not to put the spotlight on me like, oh, look at me, but I think it's important to acknowledge where you've done something wrong and to be able to just apologize and keep going. Like you don't have to make a big deal out of it, but it is important to acknowledge it. And, you know, that was something that they appreciated. And I think that that grace of like, you're, (laughs) I I say, you're going to eat some Nike. You're going to put your foot in your mouth. It's going to (laughs) happen. (laughs) So like, it's going to happen, but you have to give yourself that grace to keep going. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could have very easily just been like, oh my gosh, I screwed up. I don't know how I, I just started this and I got two more hours to go and Mm. I'm a terrible person. And I'm like, no, because, you know, this human has shown me what it can be to constantly try to evolve. And Mm. so I would be dishonoring what it is that matters to them by not doing that. And so for me, it was like, I have to give myself grace and I got to keep going knowing that I made a mistake. I did make amends and I'm going to consciously continue doing better. Mm -hmm. And the pause comes from just having that moment sometimes in your head of just like, is that what I want to say? Is that what I want to convey? Is that what I want to communicate? So kind of that like you know how sometimes you can just talk and you're like, wait, wait, that wasn't what I right. meant to say. Reel that baby back. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so sometimes the pause can help for you to just kind of reorganize and to really, you know, consider before you you let it go. Like, wait, you know, what's the impact that I want to make here? And the more you do it, the more adept you'll get at being able to kind of do it a little more seamlessly, a little more on the fly. But the reality is, is that there's learning opportunities in being less than perfect. And so if you get it all right, you're not continuing to grow. You're not learning other things along the way in order to have, you know, other tools in your tool belt and other frames of reference and other, you know, operations of normal for other people that you were unaware of. So as uncomfortable as they can be. You need those teachable moments. We all need those teachable moments. Mm -hmm. That is where the magic happens. And we Mm -hmm. have to remind ourselves that they're not bad. We are not bad. It is just a part of learning. And I always use the analogy of little kids. Like, you know, kids learning how to walk is not going to be like, you know, this whole walking thing. I keep falling. (laughs) I'm just going to sit down on the floor. You know, this pamper is comfortable. I'm going to stay right here. I'm not getting up. This falling Mm -hmm. is not for me. (laughs) You know, they... They fall, they get up, they 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 bang into stuff, they whack themselves. I fall, and I'm a whole 42-year-old adult. <laughs> and so, you know, we have to remind ourselves that missteps and mistakes happen. That's not the challenge. It's what you do next. Hmm. I think what it is is I hear everything you're saying. I agree with it. But it's more than that, I think, a little bit. It's having... You know, you have to you have to have grace. You have to have grace for yourself and others when a mistake is made so that that person that you were mentioning, that that person needed to show you grace also. Right. You had to show yourself grace and that person had to show you grace. But there's also um, courage. There's courage because Mm -hmm. when you make a mistake and you're learning to walk, you fall on your butt. And you do get up again. But when you make a mistake out in the world like this, you risk hurting someone. Um, And it, you know, it takes courage to, this is my heart. This is what I want to do. This is what I, how I want to show up. This is what I want to say. But like when I read that on your line, but sometimes you don't, you know, you just get a little frozen and you don't move. It's because there's other people on the other side of your statements. And 
it's a t- it, I just I'm just sharing with you that I think it's, absolutely you know it's it's hard because it's you know don't you know like let's not forget there's always the feeling of like hey and I don't want to look like a dummy either I don't want to like not you know I get that that ego part is in all of us it's what you know keeps us alive on this planet that we care about ourselves but you know it is also I don't know there's other people on the other end of the things that we say. So it's courage, I, grace and pause and courage. I would add to that if I could, <laughs> Erica, <laughs> be so bold as to put another yeah, well, verb I, on. I do, <laughs> no, I agree because I do think, I do think that courage is a part of it. And I think that people can sometimes convince themselves that they have a lack of courage mm. when That's not always true. Mm -hmm. It's just that maybe they have not had to use their courage in this particular way Mm -hmm. because the reality is So they're hiding behind the safety of it is what you're saying. Right. Yes. Because in my opinion, I think that, you know, if, I mean, if we take it down and go really meta, I mean, we get in, you know, thousands of pound, you know, vehicles every day and we go driving around at high (laughs) speed. He's like, we might not think about it. but While we're texting, talking, eating, and all the things. <laughs> right. And so if we think about it, there's a lot of things that do take courage, but we have gone on autopilot with it. And so mm. it's the acknowledging of courage that is no longer automatic to mm. us. Mm. We're acknowledging where we have to um, redistribute our courage into places that we previously maybe didn't feel as though we needed it. And yet... Mm courage is an innate part of simply existing day to day and we don't always recognize it we touch objects that have large amounts of electric current going through them Mm -hmm. we get into a shower with water in it where we can slip at any given moment Mm -hmm. like you know any anything can happen i don't say this to like like folks don't get scared i swear this is not to scare you (laughs) but it's to say that how many things do you do on a daily basis that whether you recognize it or not do require courage Mm. and what's being asked of you is to simply redistribute some of that courage into these places that maybe you otherwise weren't using as much or maybe you need a little bit more there in this particular moment or this particular, you know, experience and being able to tap into that, knowing that courage is a resource that we have access to for these moments when we feel less than courageous, if we allow ourselves to tap into our reserves. I love it. Courage is a resource. I love it. I just wrote that down. That's so good, Erica. And it's good. Just reminding us that we have it. We have it. And we just have to, you know, acknowledge it, face it and put our big girl panties on and just do it. That's the way it is. Right. Like you said, we get in a 2000 pound vehicle and, you know, scream our heads off at the top of our lungs to journey or something. So Right. right. And so there are times where it's like, you know, your, your, your slacks, your pants, your overalls, your, your dress, your skirt, your, your none of the above. Cause Hey, bro bodies are important too. Whatever that is that you need to put on to feel empowered yep. in your own courage mm-hmm. in your own power in your own influence it's it is there but it's up to you to to know that you do have access to it we tap into our reserves of of being in action of being courageous of being ambitious of of being outspoken in in ways it being creative in ways that we just they've become part of the furniture And so the more that you step into or move into your imperfect allyship, you are figuring out what pieces there can ultimately become part of the furniture and that it doesn't feel as scary or as challenging or as difficult, but also understanding some of it never truly becomes easy. It just gets a little less hard. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's not really the criteria for doing it, whether it's easy or not. Right. (laughs) That's the bottom line. (laughs) But but we're humans. And let's be honest, we like to not feel like I'm just going to keep running into this wall. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know what, Erica, though? I mean, we literally 99.9 percent of the conversations on this podcast are about running your business profitably. And 
you know, it's so common for me to say, especially when I speak at events in person, because I can talk in a lot more inside voice than I do on the podcast. But I'm sorry, it isn't easy to run a business. It's darn hard. And if you're not up for it, then, you know, go work for somebody. That's a noble pursuit. So it's not about easy, especially here in my audience. We know things are hard and that we have to show up and we have to make decisions. And what you're explaining and inspiring us is that this is another one of those places. And it's as simple as that, right? I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 100%. Like, like I, nothing to add on that. <laughs> no, thank you. I love it. Okay. So before I let you go, Erica, there are ways to be involved in your world more than your podcast. So would you, I mean, you have the one-on-one, you have your community, you have the master class. Would you just give us a little bit of the different things? Because I'm sure there's people that are going to want to get involved in your world now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, my name is Erica Corday. I am a diversity DEI coach and consultant, but I need to take care of the whole human. So you matter as a whole. Um, you can find me at ericacorday.com. You can learn more about the podcast, uh, Implicit to Explicit, which is our values masterclass and our community, Pause on the Play the Community, all at Pause on the Play. Dot com. You'll be able to learn more about the services that we offer. You'd be able to sign up for our newsletter to be able to hear a little bit more about what's going on. I have a newsletter as well of my own. Um, and so that you can kind of be abreast of what's going on. We have a lot of cool things coming up. We're beginning to do some kind of favorite things, shopping parties, being able to highlight and amplify some of our favorite brands, getting into what's essential. We have so much amazing stuff going on. So you can come on over, learn a little bit more about about it. And again, if you would like to join the community, that's pause on the play.com forward slash community. Love it. I love it. Well, thank you. I'm so grateful to you, Erica, for sharing your time, your wisdom, your heart with us today. Thank you so much. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you, Luann. So what's your normal? It seems like we don't even notice what normal is for us. We're just going along, doing our thing. We probably don't notice how we're thinking until someone or something stands outside of our normal and prompts us to consider something else, right? When we stop and we think that someone else's normal isn't our normal, it's sort of mind-blowing, right? I mean, that's the whole point of all of these conversations. Get out of your own head. All right. We can, we tend to walk around and think everyone's thinking what we're thinking, no matter who we are, we're thinking, you know, that's it. Our mature adult minds know that this can't possibly be the case, but we're not always logical, are we? And that's the root of the problem, right? I mean, it shouldn't be news to us that people have dramatically different upbringings and life experiences. And I love how Erica puts it. We are all processing through our own lens, but there has to be a space of understanding. We're all different, and that is a beautiful thing. But, and, so, right? But, and so, how do we ensure that we extend kindness and seek to understand those who are outside of our normal, that are in their own normal? That's the point, okay? How do we invite them to bring themselves as they truly are to a conversation or an encounter with us. I like what Erica said. The conversation is the starting point. Sometimes it probably might even just start with a smile. Just a simple universal way of letting someone know that you're okay, you're happy even that they're in your life, whether it's standing beside you in the grocery store or working across from you at a table, right? And from there, conversations are a natural way of getting to know someone, being genuinely interested in and talking with someone who doesn't, as Erica says, live, love, and look the way I do. Okay? Think about it. Live, love, and look the way I do. But they live, love, and look the way they do. Right? I do think that even if we are happy to get to know some. We are sometimes held back by fear, okay? What if we say the wrong thing? What is okay to say? If I say X, Y, Z, will that hurt them? Will that be offensive? And I love Erica's advice here as well. Just take a couple of seconds of pause 
to check on your intent, your tone, your word choice, and then you got to grab your courage and go for it. And that's the thing. We probably each will say the wrong thing sometimes, oftentimes. Just think of it. Erica is a DEI coach, and she said she still puts her foot in her mouth sometimes. All right? That's okay, because she's putting herself out there. She's trying to reach across and open that dialogue and that communication, right? She's not expecting herself to be perfect. She's not expecting us to be perfect. We're human. When Erica goofed up, she apologized and moved on. Both parties can do well when grace is present. You know, Kay Whitaker, when she came on my show last year, she said the same thing. She said, I have to give grace for you, but you have to give grace for me, right? So I think it's like anything else. The more conversations we have with others outside of our quote unquote normal, the more comfortable and natural it will be. I think the elephant in the room can get the heck out of the room if we'll just simply start by having a conversation with someone who's interesting, that we're having an open mind about, and that we're just trying to explore what they think, what they feel, what their experiences are, right? And I like Erica's practical advice when it comes to hiring as well. She says that before you bring someone in, consider whether it's safe for that person to be there. And also remember, diversity is more than just race. It's variety in gender, sexual orientation, lived experience, ability, professional calling, and more. All right. Take pause and think if you have prepared the environment to be respectful for the new hire. Will they feel less than like they only have a seat at the table because they're the diversity hire? completely counterproductive, right? Depending on your culture, implementation of DEI measures could take some real conversations with your team and a frank conversation with the new hire as well. Erica suggests letting the new hire and anyone on the team know that you don't have it all figured out. And if they see something coming off, all right, that doesn't feel right, that you're open to a conversation. But check yourself. Are you out open to a conversation? Don't just say you are, right? <laughs> you know, like it's like when, you know, little girls, how are you today? I'm fine. It's like nobody thinks you're fine. <laughs> you, didn't, nobody conv- you didn't convince anybody. So you have to actually come to it open hearted, all right? The goal is to really foster a company culture where anyone can come to you if something is bothering them or when they see something isn't right, right? So, you know, have a little heart to heart with yourself. Okay. And if something does come up, this is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's part of the process. All right. Erica reminds us that if a change is being made or there's a new initiative, that depending on where our particular company culture is at the present moment, that that change probably shouldn't be a sudden change, but instead be open to and expect incremental change. Right. It's like a crash diet. You lose 20 pounds, it doesn't stick. But if you lose two pounds, uh, you know, a week, it tends to stick. So make meaningful changes that you process, that you, you know, really live and breathe and that your company can sustain. That's the goal. Okay. So Erica's advice on being an open and attentive listener goes right back to the qualities of being a great salesperson. Honestly, just being a great human being, right? Listening. Just like sales is two people having a conversation, looking for the win-win, as Erica puts it, a real conversation is a minimum of two people contributing and communicating as their whole self. It's active listening. It's seeking to understand than being understood, okay? Take a little second on that. A minimum of two people. How many times have you been in a conversation with somebody and it's like one-sided? That's what she means by a minimum of two people contributing and communicating as their whole self. Are in your half, in your part of the conversation, are you open enough to let the other person communicate and contribute as their whole self? So I'm going back on these things because these are the things, okay? These are the things in actually making the changes rather than just talking about the changes, all right? 
So I'm going to pause here and thank my show sponsor, Kravit. You know, at Window Works, we have been having quality conversations with Kravit since the very beginning of our company. They know how to listen and how to deliver a premium experience and premium fabrics for both us and for our clients. If you want 10% off any one Kravit fabric wallpaper or trim, when you check out, use the code AWDB10. If you don't have your trade account yet, you can go to Kravit.com and sign up. The link will also be in the show notes. So what do you think? Tis the season, right? Well, it's always the season. That's the truth. To gather and to share experiences sparked by genuine conversation. It's a great time to get to know someone new and to do yourself a favor and expand what normal is in your head. Right? All righty. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. And Erica, thank you tons to you. My absolute hat off to you. I enjoyed meeting you and our conversation was outstanding. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.